This right here is the Zyxel NWA 130BE and it's most likely the main competitor to the Ubiquiti U7 Pro. The NWA 130BE is actually the second Wi-Fi 7 access point that Zyxel has made available and yes, it's less equipped than its older sibling. But my current position is that you should not invest too much in a new technology, especially since we're dealing with early Wi-Fi 7 draft stage. The reason I say that we're looking at the U7 Pro main competitor is not only because they're very close in terms of price, but also because there are some similarities in terms of features as well. The NWA 130B is a tri-band access point, so it does support the 6 GHz radio band, but just like the U7 Pro, the configuration is 2x2 MIMO across all three radios. Additionally, there was no love for the 5 or 10 gigabit ports, and instead we do get 2.5 gigabit. The good news is that at least we get two ports. What about the multilink operation? Ubiquiti has moved the goalposts several times for the multilink operation release for unknown reasons. And that's the situation right now, while this video is being made. And Zyxer seems to work on adding the support for this feature to the NWA 130B in the future as well. Additionally, I did open both of these devices and the NWA 130B relies on passive cooling, while the U7 Pro has a fan. If you're curious how well the Zyxel NWA 130B performed, then stick around. I was actually surprised to see that Zyxel released a fairly compact Wi-Fi 7 access point. But then again, the WBE660S had to test the waters and be the larger access point, allowing the developers to come up with a smaller case for the NWA 130BE. Or at least, that's how I assume things went. And yes, the case is made of plastic and it has been pointed out to me by a user that it's a better conductive material than the standard plastic that's used in this industry. I have no idea whether the ACW536 or the U7 Pro use the same type of material. Size-wise, it's a bit larger than the U7 Pro, but significantly smaller than the ingenious ACW536, and it was designed to be only installed on a ceiling or wall, so it has no fit to stand steadily on the desk. As for the LED, there is a thin transparent section at the top which allows the light to shine through, and it does rely on different colors to let you know what's going on with the device. Turning the access point upside down again, we can see the port section where there is a 12 volt DC power connector and the two 2.5 gigabit ports, but only the uplink one supports PoE+, the other does not. If you're wondering where's the reset button, it can be found on the side underneath the plastic cover and it sits next to the console port. Is there a chance that the Zyxel NWA 130BE would survive outdoor conditions? No, the access point was designed for indoor use only. Zyxel decided that the NWA 130BE does not need a fan for thermal management, so it relied on passive cooling as it did with pretty much all other access points that they built until now. But is it enough to keep the temperature low, or was Ubiquiti the wiser brand? I did use a thermal camera to see how hot the access point got while I was running the multi-client tests, and as you can see it does have some warm spots, but I'm fairly sure it will not lead to throttling or case discoloration. But yes, the fan on the U7 Pro does help lowering the temperature by about 10 degrees when compared to the NWA 130BE. If you need to take a peek inside the Zyxel NWA 130BE, you only need to remove the four screws from the bottom side and use a prying tool to detach the top section. There are no warranty seals or any other similar stuff. Zyxel has attached a metallic heat sink to the bottom of the case for a better heat transfer, and after detaching the upper side we can see the antenna plate. Unfortunately, it's not the smart antenna layout that can be found on the WBE660S, but we're still getting what Zyxel calls the advanced RF filter design, which should help minimize the potential interference between the 5 GHz and the 6 GHz radio bands. There are also some filters to help limit the interference with the 4G, 5G cellular networks as well. As for the main components, I have gone through all of them in the video. But you can also see a comparison table with other Wi-Fi access points as well. 
Since it's a part of the early draft stage, the Zyxel NWA 130B is decently equipped and it offers a very similar set of features to the U7 Pro. Unfortunately, we still get no support for the multi-link operation, which is one of the most important features that came from the new Wi-Fi standard. That's because it aggregates multiple radio bands and uses them to transmit data across more than a single channel at the same time. Another feature that's needed and may become a part of the software in the future is the multi-RU puncturing. Lastly, I should also mention the 320 MHz channel bandwidth, which is a standard now for the 6 GHz radio, as well as the 4K COM modulation. I did previously have some issues with the Intel B200 adapter, but now that I finally managed to get my hands on a Qualcomm-based Wi-Fi 7 adapter, hopefully we will get to see the true potential of these new access points. Before delving into the multi-client stress tests, Let's first see some more basic iPerf tests, but don't worry, because I have made sure to add the signal attenuation so that you can easily reproduce these results in your own home. That being said, I use multiple types of client devices, including a couple of Wi-Fi 5 computers, one Wi-Fi 6 and one Wi-Fi 7 client. Before anything else, I do need to mention just how great the throughput was upstream using the 160 MHz channel bandwidth and the 5 GHz radio. It's very similar to the performance that I saw using the 6 GHz 320 MHz channel bandwidth. But all this holds true for the upstream performance, while downstream it's a very different story. As you can see, the 5 GHz Wi-Fi performance was good and fairly predictable, while on the 6 GHz band things were far less impressive. I have seen this type of behavior on the Intel B200 as well, Probably a driver limitation, but I can't be sure at this time. This is why it's better to wait a bit with new technology. Let it mature more, so you don't end up being the beta or even alpha tester unwillingly. I've also added a longer term Wi-Fi performance graph, so you can get a better idea about what to expect from the 5 GHz and the 6 GHz radio bands. When compared to other access points, the NWA 130B performed well, reaching the top of the list. I suppose the 2.4 GHz radio is still very much worthy of our attention, even if it was left for the smart devices. And Zyxer has made sure that we get a good performance, especially near the access point. For the multi-client tests, I use the same tools as before, the open source NetHydra developed by Mr. Jim Salter, and I still relied on the same client devices as before. One Wi-Fi 6E computer, two identical Wi-Fi 6 laptops, one Wi-Fi 5 MacBook Pro and one Wi-Fi 5 Zimo board A32 mini PC. I used the 5 GHz radio band and the 80 MHz channel bandwidth which is the most likely combination that a large majority of people will end up using. Also, this is the list of the signal attenuation for each client device. The first test checks if the Zyxel access point can't handle 5 client devices streaming 1080p content at the same time, and as you can see, we do get a couple of clients which hovered near 50 milliseconds for 90% of the time, which is decent, and the only client devices that surpassed 100 milliseconds are the two Wi-Fi 5 devices. It's understandable why the Zimo board showed this behavior, because it has the highest signal attenuation. Still, it's curious to see how the same client device had the same max spike as on the U7 Pro, although negligible since it's a rare occurrence, probably due to a CPU spike. Next, I checked the simultaneous 4K streaming performance with a cap throughput at 35 megabits per second. If I were to compare the collected values to what we saw using the U7 Pro, they're really not that much different. The Wi-Fi 5 client devices are again the outliers, while all other three clients stayed below 100 milliseconds for at least 95% of the time. Is that enough? I would have liked to see something along the lines of 20 or 30 milliseconds, but we can still see two computers staying near 60 milliseconds for 75% of the time. It could have been better, so you will see some buffering from time to time. Moving forward, I added intense browsing traffic simulation to run alongside the 1080p streaming and it's moving 12 by 128 kilobytes of data with 500 milliseconds of jitter to mimic the behavior of a regular web page. 
Again, we see some similarities with the U7 Pro. The Wi-Fi 6C and the Wi-Fi 6 clients this stay at or near 50 milliseconds for 75% of the time, with a slight increase towards 100 milliseconds for about 1% of the time. The intense browsing performance when ran alongside the 1080p streaming was decent, and while the U7 Pro did a bit better, it was still a good performance, staying below 300 milliseconds for 95% of the time across all clients, but there was a spike above 1 second for 2 clients. As long as it's not above 1.5 seconds, I suppose it's still passable. Moving to the 4K streaming and intense browsing, we see that the latter showed decent results for about 75% of the time on the Wi-Fi 6 and 6C clients, but there is a slow rise towards 100 milliseconds and above which shows that the users will experience some buffering. The intense browsing graph showed that all clients stayed at a decent level with only two rising above one second for 1% of the time. Moving forward, I switched things a bit and ran and kept downloading traffic onto clients which would move 10 megabytes files continuously. Then one client ran intense browsing and the last one had to deal with 4K streaming. The clients handling the downloading traffic displayed some bad latency numbers, especially the one that moved between 60 and 70 seconds. It's a very similar performance to the U7 Pro, although I would argue that the 4K streaming latency was a bit better on the Zyxer access point. Is 300 milliseconds better than 400 milliseconds? Yes. Does it matter? Not that much, because you were still going to have a bad time. By the way, the total throughput for the downloading clients was 611.4 megabits per second. Let's take it a bit easier and use a single client for the downloading traffic while two clients handle 4K streaming and the last two manage the intense browsing. And things got very interesting here because the downloading latency stayed below 200 milliseconds for 75% of the time and only raised above 300 milliseconds for 1% of the time. This is far better than what we saw on the U7 Pro. Actually, even the 4K streaming and the intense browsing were handled much better on the NWA 130BE. Afterwards, I adjusted the downloaded traffic to move a 1 megabyte file continuously, while the other two clients handled 4K streaming and voice over IP. The voice over IP latency was better on the U7 Pro, but the 4K streaming latency was lower on the Zyxel access point. As for the downloading client, the latency passed 1 second for both. Lastly, I ran the downloading traffic simulation on all client devices, and this is the result. The total throughput was 542.8 megabits per second, below the total available bandwidth. The cloud platforms are a very convenient way to monitor and configure one or more sites, but I admit that I don't trust any company to keep the support for a certain device indefinitely. Stuff can happen, and you don't want to end up with an expensive paperweight. The good news is that the Zyxel NWA 130BE does provide a standalone configuration interface and it's a feature-rich one. The layout seems simple to navigate, but it's far from perfect. We do get some status info right away and there is also the monitor, configure and maintenance section, a standard approach. If you try to adjust the wireless settings, it can feel a bit like a maze. That is, unless you get familiar with the interface. I suppose old school would be a proper description. There are radio settings under AP management and you do need to change the security profile using the small icons on the side. You can also change the mode of the radio between AP mode, root AP and repeater. Additionally, there's rogue AP management, DCS and load balancing available. A separate and better laid out list of the radios and the SSIDs can be found under Object AP Profile, but what I found annoying was that the 2.4 GHz radio was stuck at the 20 MHz channel bandwidth, and could not be changed to the 40 MHz. It's not really a limitation of the hardware because I could change it in the Nebula controller. Other than that, there is a plethora of options and settings tailored for specific applications, but I'm not going to go through all of them right now. Instead, let's see what the cloud management platform has to offer. Before anything else, understand that there are some features that are locked behind various types of licenses, 
but I'm going to have a look at what you can get using the base pack. The status info focus dashboard is the first page you're going to visit and I also noticed that there is a topology section, just like on the Unify, but it's locked behind the pro subscription. Under devices you can see the supported categories and you can also navigate towards the NWA 130BE by checking out the active access points. The dedicated page is mostly covered by its status information. You can also check out the Zyxer switch that I used for testing out the Wi-Fi 7 access point. Couldn't do it without its 10 gigabit ports. I know there is a client section available, but I haven't seen it populated while I was using the NWA 130BE. Most likely a bug that needs to be addressed. There's also an application usage and summary report, and then we finally get to the monitor and configure sections. Under monitor, you do get the base log and summary report. And if you want more, you do need to get a pro pack. The configure section will let you set up the SSIDs, and I did like that you can set up the captive portal for each of them. Quite useful in hotels and similar businesses. But to set up the security side of the SSIDs, just go directly to the SSID advanced settings. The next area of interest is the radio settings, where you do get a fair amount of options for each of the three radio bands. Under AP and port settings, we see that it's possible to enable the smart mesh to connect the NWA 130BE to other Zyxel access points in a mesh network. There's also Ethernet failover and even AP grouping, although be aware that the last one is in beta mode. Pretty much everything else, including some advanced security options, are available in the Pro Pack once again. Do you actually need them? It depends on the types of clients you have and how large and complicated the network will be. In most cases, I didn't need these features, but they can make things easier. So, is the Zyxion WA 130B better than the U7 Pro? Objectively speaking, the Zyxion access point is almost identical to the U7 Pro in terms of Wi-Fi 7 features, and even in terms of hardware. Well, minus the annoying fan. But with this type of devices, you don't really have the flexibility of using mixed hardware from different brands. If you have mostly ubiquity equipment, the U7 Pro will satisfy some basic needs for the 6GHz radio, although I would argue that the U6 Enterprise may feel more mature. But if the hardware you're using is mostly Zyxel, or are willing to switch from a different brand, then the NWA 130BE will be an excellent addition to the network. Just be aware about its cloud software quirks. That's about it for today. Thank you for watching and see you next time.